in Matthew 24, this is the chapter which deals with the signs of the times. And if you look at verse 3, it says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Sign of your coming and the end of the world. So then Jesus answers that. Matthew 24 and also 25 deals with the condition of the church, the ten virgins, the talents, and the sheep and the goats. All of that is the answer to their question. The whole of 24 and 25 combined answer the question. So you want to study that together as one. 24 and 25. But Jesus answered and said, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, but deceive you on what is the conversation about, the second coming of Christ. So Jesus' first answer is that, Take heed that no man deceive you. So this is why I'm doing this study, because this is a point whereby millions will be deceived on in regards to the second coming of Christ. Now look at verse 4. Jesus says, Take heed that no man deceive you. Look at verse number five. For many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and shall do what? Deceive many. Two times, speaking about deception. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Deception again. Number three. Verse 24. There shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Four times in one chapter, Jesus said, beware of deception, beware of deception. Individuals are out there to deceive you. Who's going to deceive? False prophets. Who else? False Christ. Many will come in my name saying that I am Christ and shall deceive me. So now we have, to make the matters worse, you have Satan seeking to deceive mankind with distractions and things happening so you have no time to study God's word. Secondly, you have these false preachers out there. These individuals are telling people, no, Jesus is not coming soon. You don't have to change your life. You know, Jesus will save you as you are. He's a loving God. You know, God will not destroy anyone and no one, everyone's going to go to heaven together. You have all these false teachers teaching error, teaching, having itching ears, having the people lull to sleep with these bedtime story sermons. These pastors out there, these individuals, evangelists, preaching nothing, are the ones deceiving the masses so they're not ready for Jesus' second coming. So you have this group. Then you have not only the false prophets, the preachers, you have these false Christ individuals coming upon the scene saying, I am Christ, deceiving individuals. And both classes are deceived because they're not rooted in the Bible. So you have all this deception. Satan is false Christ, false prophets. All of them doing the work. So we see deception is going to be everywhere in regards to the second coming of Christ. Now, when Satan comes upon the scene, it's not something hard for him because Satan can work miracles. And we see even in the Bible that in Genesis chapter 3, you know, Satan used a serpent as a medium and he spoke to Eve. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 28, when in regards to Saul, you see the demon there appear as if being Samuel. These evil angels can work miracles and they can come off to deceive mankind. So the question we want to look at is, what is the purpose for these miracles to take place? What is the purpose of it? We see here in Matthew 24 verse 24, it's to deceive the very elect to deceive God's people. Now, in the Bible, Satan is very deceptive. And when you look throughout the scriptures, you see some of the things that Satan has done. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. So with that, Satan has the capability to make tornadoes, to make storms, to make all these calamities in the air so that individuals can lose their life. Just to talk about some of the aspects of Satan power here, because when Christ cast Satan out of heaven, he lost none of his power. He still has all the power that he had being the covering cherub. He has all that power within him, so he can do a lot of evil with that power. We saw here that in Exodus, when Pharaoh's magicians there, they were able to counterfeit the miracles of Aaron. Remember? Aaron threw down. He had snake, 
than they had wasn't real snakes, but they made it appear to be snakes because Satan cannot give life. And what happened? Aaron's snakes swallowed their snakes, just showing how God has more power over Satan. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here we go. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel. Why is this not something to marvel about that you have false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ? This is no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And this is what he's going to do. Transform himself into an angel of light. So let's get into it. Matthew chapter 24. Let's start at verse 25. Matthew 24 verse 25. The Bible says, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Now, if you see the verses before it from Verse 23, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. That's going to be doing signs and wonders. So here we have false Christ, plural, false prophets, plural. But then when you read down the passage, it turns into singular. It says here, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So you're going to have false Christ doing false miracles and all these things, signs and wonders, and then setting the stage for Satan himself to come and personate Christ. That's why it transitions from plural, Christ, into singular. Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. That he is speaking about not Jesus Christ, because you know Jesus is not touching the ground, that he, in Matthew 24, is speaking about Satan personating Jesus Christ. Now, what is the difference between impersonate and personate? Now, an impersonator is someone who dresses up, they even speak like a person, but everyone knows that's not the real person. So the typical example would be an Elvis impersonator. You go down there to Las Vegas, you see all these Elvis impersonators. Everyone sees them. He's singing Elvis songs, acting like Elvis, but everyone knows that's not Elvis because Elvis is dead. That's an impersonator. You know it's not the person, but they are acting like the person in dress, speech, and such and such. A personator is a person who takes on the form of an individual and when the intention to make you believe that they are the person. So that's the difference between a personation. That's why Satan is going to personate Christ. He is coming stating that he is Christ to deceive everyone to believe that he actually is Christ. Impersonator will not deceive. A personator has the power to deceive. And that's what Satan's going to do. He's going to personate Christ. He's going to personate Christ to deceive individuals. Now let's go into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So that's where it can be seen in Matthew 24. The he there is speaking about Satan coming as Christ to deceive. And it's very interesting that it says the desert and those secret places because I personally believe that when Satan does this, he's going to come over there, especially to the Middle East area, where Christ was, and appear as Christ, and do his miracles over there to deceive the Jews, to deceive people in the world, that Christ has indeed come in the desert over there. We will see. But the Bible says, go not forth, if he's over there in the desert. Now we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now what we're going to read in this chapter, verse 1, we're going to, in context, 
this chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the context of what this chapter is speaking about is the second coming of Christ. Extremely important. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus coming, and by our gathering un together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So remember, Paul wrote First Thessalonians chapter 4 when he says Jesus is going to come with a trump, voice of the archangel, then in Christ shall rise, those who remain be caught up. So then in Second Thessalonians, he's going to clarify, because they thought that Jesus was coming immediately. But Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, certain events have to take place first before Jesus returns. So it's not going to be imminently in the time of Paul when Jesus comes because certain events have to take place. Let's see what happens. Verse number 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Did you see that in Matthew? Four times. Let no man deceive you in regards to what? The second coming. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Son of perdition also spoken of in John 17 as Judas. Who is this son of perdition spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Which is in the church the son of perdition. This here is speaking about the son of perdition in this verse here of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, speaking about the Pope, the son of perdition, the man of sin. Verse 4 now, speaking about who opposed it and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. How does he do that? Because, as we all know, Pope Francis accepts worship in the temple of God, in the church of God. He accepts worship and he exalts himself above all that is called God, showing himself that he is God, the man of sin. Okay, now that right there is speaking about Antichrist papacy. Okay, let's continue. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? So Paul spoke, told them about what's going to happen face to face or in letter. He told them of these things. And now ye know that which withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Okay, something is withholding. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work in the time of Paul. Paul could see, prophetic vision and what was taking place in Rome there, that the stage was being set for Rome, pagan Rome, to transition into papal Rome. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he will now let it, will let until he be taken out of the way. He will now let it, that word let it means hinders, prevents, or obstructs, will let until he be taken out of the way. So before the papacy could come on the scene, pagan Rome had to go down, and then here comes up that little horn, Daniel 7, the papacy. He will now let, will let it until he be taken out of the way. This is, this is the same thing in Daniel chapter 8, where the daily shall be taken away. Paganism is removed for papal Rome to come on scene. Paul is speaking about the same thing here, the transition. Verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Boom. Christ comes. Here goes the fall of the papacy here. Now, verse 9. Now, verse 9 says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, Paul was first speaking about the Antichrist, power, papacy here, but now he's going to transition into, let's see, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, we're going to take keen attention here. Power, Signs, lying wonders, three things. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse 22. Here the Bible reads, says, now listen to what we're speaking about. 
ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Who are we speaking about? Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs. How? Miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So here, Acts 2.22, Jesus did miracles, wonders, and signs. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, here it says, working of Satan now with power, signs, and lying wonders. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. So it's going to transition in this passage here. First speaking, Antichrist, papacy. But then there is the Antichrist who is even behind Catholicism. Who is that? The real true Antichrist, Satan himself. So now it's going to be speaking about Satan. Now look what's going to take place here. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now as you saw in Acts 2.22, Jesus did miracles, Jesus, power, signs, wonders. Jesus did that in Acts 2.22. So now here Satan is going to come upon the scene and work his wonders and power to do what? To deceive mankind. What is the context of this chapter? The second coming of Christ. So when the Antichrist is revealed and during the mark of the beast crisis, Satan himself is going to come upon the scenes Doing what? Signs, wonders, miracles. Now, verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because those who are perishing, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So what is this truth that they receive not the love of this particular truth that they might be saved? What's the truth? that these individuals did not receive. What is the truth that they did not receive in the context of the chapter? The truth in regards to the second coming of Christ. And this is why these individuals are deceived. They are not receiving the love of the truth. What truth? The truth about the second coming of Christ. How he's going to come. The manner in which he's coming. The second coming of Christ. And now look at verse 12 that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So when it says here in verse 11, God shall send them strong delusions, all it's speaking about is that they've made their choice, they've rejected the truth here, and then God steps back, okay, you reject the truth, well then you will receive a lie, and when it says here, God will send them strong delusion. God is not deluding them. Satan is deceiving them. But what God allows, he attributes to himself because he allowed it to take place. But God is in no wise deceiving anybody. God is truth. It is Satan who is going to deceive mankind. Why is he deceiving them? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So in this passage here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we recap, First, it speaks about Antichrist, papal power. Then it goes into the power working behind that who is going to come upon the scenes and to deceive mankind in regards to the second coming of Christ, which will be Satan himself personating Christ with power, signs, and lying wonders. He is going to come upon the scene. This is going to be the great overmastering delusion which will take place. Now, he does this to deceive. Now, when Satan does this, there's going to be a crisis taking place upon planet Earth, especially first starting out in America, which is the mark of the beast crisis. So he is, this is the masterpiece of his deception. And I'm going to read into you in the spirit of prophecy in regards to what he's actually going to be doing in a little bit. But he's going to do this for the purpose to deceive people who are upon the earth. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 13, the miracles will be taking place upon the earth. Here it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, 
and he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the, upon the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did lead. So the purpose of Satan, personally in Christ, to do his miracles and to deceive is so that individuals on earth can get the mark of the beast. And this is his great overmastering delusion, which he's going to bring across to mankind. Now, something we want to remember is that Satan cannot counterfeit the manner of Christ's second coming in the clouds, power, glory, the Father, all the angels. He cannot counterfeit that. So all he can do is appear as Christ and do miracles here, disappear, go somewhere else, but he cannot counterfeit the manner in which he's coming. But the way in which he's going to look, how, what he's saying, what he's going to do is going to be so deceptive by all your, what you see and your emotions that if you go there, you're going to believe what he says because of what you see. So females, especially, who are more emotional, and emotions more affect women than men, when this takes place, curiosity killed the cat. Remember that. Curiosity killed that cat. Do not go. Do not say, oh, let me just see so I can just see what's taking place so that I can warn people about the error. Do not. Jesus says, don't go. Don't look at it. If it's on television, don't even look at it. No curiosity on this. Satan will deceive you. So he's going to do these miracles to deceive people to get more people on his side. This is going to be a catalyst and it's going to take place when all these end time events is taking place with the mark of the beast crisis. So now we're going to go and see some statements here with the spirit of prophecy as we look into this. We saw 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 already. We saw Matthew 24, verse 24. And he's doing these signs and wonders. So let's get into what will take place. Satan's miracles here. Now herein, I'm going to read from Second Selected Messages, page 87 here. It says, Satan will work with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to personate Jesus Christ. If it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Now, if the counterfeit bears so close a resemblance to the genuine, it is not essential to be on guard that no man deceive you. So therefore, what is it telling us here? You better know how Jesus is coming so that you're not deceived when this takes place. Great Controversy 625 says Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. And that's what we already said, but we just want to drill it through. Satan cannot counterfeit the manner, but he's going to appear as Christ to deceive individuals on the world to get them to get the mark of the beast. That is his purpose of doing this deception. Uh, one other passage here is in 5 Bible Commentary. 1105, it says here, As the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Doctrines of devils. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ. And the world that has rejected the truth, same thing we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2 from the Bible, the world that has rejected the truth, rejected the love of the truth, that they might be damned, will receive him as the Lord of lords and kings of kings. So I just want to first show you all the Bible. Now we've seen some spirit of prophecy on the same topic. This is what's going to take place, the almost overmastering delusion. And this will take place after the mark of the beast is enforced here in America first. And as we know, it goes throughout the whole world, Revelation 13, and all the world will wander after the beast when the deadly wound is healed. So that's still future. So this event is still future, but we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth now so that we're not deceived and also so that we can warn others 
before this takes place so that they will not be deceived when it takes place. Extremely important. Satan will come upon the scene as Christ himself. Therefore, you would do well to study your Bible and get this book, A Great Controversy. A Great Controversy. It goes in detail, full of scriptures, about what is to take place on this earth, the great controversy. Get a copy. If you don't have it, you can read it online. You can get the Ellen White app, so accessible and the most accessible books on the planet. You can get it so easily, no excuse. So I'm going to read from the great controversy, and this is what it says here. This I'm reading now from page 600, and it will be 624 into 625 if you have a great controversy by Ellen White. It says here, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. And remember, when Jesus was on earth, he was on earth for 33 years. Satan, of course, he's on the earth. He's watching Christ every single day. His demons are watching Christ, seeking to tempt him, seeking to tempt him, to get him to sin. Because he knew if he sinned just once, he could not save mankind. But Jesus did not sin, praise God. So we, have, we can have eternal life through faith in him. Now, Satan watched Christ every single day, watching him, watching him, watching him. So Satan knows exactly what Jesus said. He knows exactly how Jesus looked. He know mannerisms of Christ, and Satan has the ability to take the form of a man. And we studied that in our other topics with the state of the dead, how demons can take the form of a person and imitate it perfectly as if they are the person. Because right before Satan comes to personate Christ, we're told also that about doctrines of devils, that evil angels will personally loved ones to get individuals to believe that the Sabbath has been changed from Saturday to Sunday. So not only is Satan going to come up on the scene as Christ, evil angels are going to come up on the scene as loved ones with these error doctrine that they're going to come to individuals and tell them doctrines of devils to deceive them. So Satan will personate Christ. Remember, he saw Christ all the 33 years. The church has long professed to look for the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come, here's significant, in different parts of the earth. He can do this deception. Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. Resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. Now let's look at that. Revelation chapter 1, we have our Bibles. Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. It says here, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 14. His head and his ears were white like wool, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Revelation 1, 13 to 15. When Satan comes on the scene on earth, different places, he is going to personate how Christ looked in this passage we just read. That's how he is going to appear, like how Christ appeared in his glorified form. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have ever yet beheld. This is why the Bible says, go not forth, because the glory is unsurpassed anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the ear. Christ has come. Christ has come. Now here's what the people do. The people 
prostrate themselves in adoration before him, while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. You see, he's just acting just like Christ was when he was upon the earth. Now, here's how he speaks His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. Bet you that's the same way he spoke to Eve, full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. Now, here's what he does. Talked about the miracles from the Bible. Here it says here, he heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. He claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels, angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. So this is how you could not be deceived when this takes place. Even though dazzling brightness, miracles, what he says will show who it is. He's going to say the Sabbath has been changed from Saturday to Sunday. And he's saying that all now needs to hollow the Sunday. So you see why he's saving this overmastering deception until after the mark of beast is enforced, enforced, when the latter rain will go forth with power, when God's people will be filled with the Holy Ghost and preaching with power, more power than Pentecost. It's going to be God's people will come, work miracles. God will have, God's people will have the power to raise the dead, heal the people, true healing. All of these will take place with God's people with the latter rain. So now Satan has to counterfeit that. He has his demons upon the scenes, false Christ, false prophets. They're working their miracles to deceive people. So all of this is taking place. Good angels and evil angels on the scene at the same time. Now that is going on. Satan says, okay, it's time for me now to do my master deception. I am going to come as Christ himself and I am going to do some miracles and everyone's going to bow before me and I am going to get worship just as I tempted Christ to fall down and worship me. He didn't, but I'm going to get these human beings to bow down and worship me, the true anti-Christ, Satan. Because remember, the Revelation 13, Revelation 13, when you look at verse 13, it says that here, the dragon, Revelation 13, the beast has souls like unto leopard, feet like unto feet of a bear, and the mouth is the mouth of a dragon, and the dra a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So now, this is a dual application. First application is pagan Rome gave the power to papal Rome, but in its ultimate sense, the dragon here is Satan who gave the power to papal Rome. Because when you go to the chapter before, who is the dragon? The dragon is verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So it is the dragon, Satan gave the power to the beast of Revelation 13. So here we see now he is coming, true Antichrist, upon the scene. It says, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point. He has clearly foretold the manner of his coming. Great controversy. Second coming. And then it says, regarding this, it quotes, Spirit of Prophecy quotes Matthew 24, 26, 27, some of the passages we looked at. And how Jesus will come, First Thessalonians 4, at that coming there is no possibility of counterfeiting. Then it says, only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and have received the love of the truth, same thing we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. And this is what will take the world captive when Satan comes 
and personates Jesus Christ. And that's his plan because that's his last deception. He's going to do that to get everyone to bow down and worship him. And I'm just going to give you one more statement and then we're going to close out here. It says here, in this age, Antichrist will appear as a true Christ and then the law of God will be made fully void in the nations of our world. That means when the market beast is enforced. Rebellion against God's law will be fully ripe. But the leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him in the place of God and deify him. But omnipotence will interpose and the, and the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan the sentence will go forth. Therefore shall her place come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord that judges her. That's Revelation 18, and that's from Testimonies to Ministers, page 62. Once again, in this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be made fully void in the nations of our world. It's still a future event. Is still a future effect because remember Babylon she makes all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication so he's gonna bring this deception around the world well by God's grace by being anchored in the truth we will not be deceived when this takes place second Thessalonians chapter 2 and Matthew 24 he is in the desert going on forth second Thessalonians chapter 2 Antichrist and the Antichrist, Satan appearing as Jesus Christ. So I pray that you receive the blessing as we've studied the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy together and that you can be more rooted and grounded so that you need not be deceived when this takes place. Keep praying for one another, studying the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit will keep you from deception. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we so thank you indeed for the Bible. We thank you that we have the truth. We have access to the truth in this time of peace that we can read the Word of God and come to a clear understanding of truth. We ask that this truth that we have heard will be as an anchor to our souls so that with all these false winds of doctrine Satan is bringing in, we'll be not like those children who are tossed to and fro we will stand firm upon the rock and our house will not be shaken. Please protect us in these times in which we are living because we know you're coming soon and we just want to be saved at last. That you would please bless their homes and protect them as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all and until next time, God bless you.